In 1903, the New York Times made the worst prediction of all time. They said that it would take between 1 million and 10 million years for humans to build flying machines, and the Wright brothers built one just nine weeks later. But to their credit, the New York Times probably should have been correct. It should be impossible for machines the size of blue whales to float through the air, to travel at 87% of the speed of sound, and to do so basically perfectly with just a 0.000014% failure rate. Jets are marvels of modern engineering, even if companies like Boeing have recently started to go into decline. Luckily, there's a new batch of hard tech startups that are taking the mantle from Boeing and Airbus and building newer, faster planes. These are companies like Boom and Hermes, like Exosonic and Astro Mechanica, who I just featured in my new podcast series called First Principles. But in order to appreciate that episode and more generally to appreciate exactly how hard it is to make a plane that flies, I think we need to go back to the fundamentals. Here's how planes fly. In order to get a plane off the ground, you have to overcome two fundamental forces, gravity and drag. You know about gravity. It's a constant acceleration towards the center of the Earth. It holds your feet to the ground, which is good, and it holds planes' wheels to the ground, which is bad. And this is intuitive. You know that it's harder to pick up a heavier weight off the ground, and you probably also know that you would be lighter on the moon because the moon is itself smaller. Gravity is also weaker between two objects as they are further apart from each other. Now, this technically means that planes actually experience a little bit less gravity when they're up at cruise altitude versus when they're down on the ground. But because the scales we're talking about are immense, the Earth is huge, and planes are flying just barely above the ground on that kind of planetary scale, it's less than half of a percent of difference in the force of gravity that you feel up there versus down on the ground here. Now, the scale of this force is set by the gravitational constant, or g, which is a weird number that looks like this. It doesn't really matter, it doesn't change any of your intuition, but technically, that is what defines the force. Now, drag is a little bit weirder. You do experience it, but less emphatically than you do gravity. Drag is what opposes you as you move through a fluid. So the reason it matters for planes is because air itself is a fluid. Yes, a fluid is just something that flows. And given that fluids are all around us, like air and water, you actually do have an intuitive sense for how drag works. You know that if you're moving your hand through water, it's gonna be more resisted than if you're moving your hand through air. You also know that if you kind of cup your hand through water and minimize the surface area, you'll shoot through the water versus if you're just doing an open palm dragging it through. Those turned into science terms means that the drag is higher as both density of the fluid increases and the cross-functional surface area of the object moving through it. And it also increases as the speed of the object moving through the fluid increases, it just has less time to get out of the way. Now, of course, you can also turn drag into a force, and to do that, you also use a scaling factor, but very differently than G, this scaling factor kind of just changes all the time. It can change based on the shape or a bunch of other things. And in practice, the only way that people actually know that real force number is by putting something in a wind tunnel, which is kind of the opposite of trying to understand it theoretically in an equation sense. But anyway, I digress. The point is those two forces, gravity and drag, need to be opposed by other forces in order for us to actually get off the ground. Drag, which is pulling us back, is overcome by thrust, which pushes us forward, and gravity, which pulls us down, is opposed by lift, which pushes us up. Now, these forces, of course, are fighting against each other, but they're also just one integrated thing that is a hard problem to optimize. If you have a big engine, for example, that might provide you more thrust, but it's heavier, so it's pulling you down harder with gravity. Now, this gets into the complexity of engineering and aircraft, and we'll talk about how these planes generate thrust and how they generate lift in just a second. But for now, we can simplify it with a very easy model. Flight is just a balancing act between four forces, lift, gravity, thrust, and drag. In 1903, the Wright brothers built and flew the first powered aircraft, the Wright Flyer. This plane used two propellers that were each 2.6 meters long. Propellers are really easy to understand. They just spin in a circle and they push air back and that pushes you forward. But humanity didn't stay with propellers for very long. The first jet engines were built in 1930 and 1940, where they were used as fighter planes for World War II. Military jet fighters turned into commercial airliners in the 1950s and 60s. And interestingly, planes have flown about that fast ever since. The Boeing 707 was released in 1960 and cruised at about 600 miles per hour. The Boeing Dreamliner was released in 2011 and cruises at 560 miles an hour. Now, granted, the Dreamliner is larger and it's more efficient and it has greater range, but I just think it's interesting that we got so good at making jet engines so fast. 
My guess as to why is that jets aren't actually that complicated from a scientific perspective. Yes, they're incredibly difficult to engineer, but it's pretty simple. I mean, according to Wikipedia, we've actually had jets since the Ordovician period, back with cephalopods, so how complicated could they be? A jet engine's job is to intake air and accelerate it. The front of a jet engine looks a lot like a propeller, because it literally is one. Modern aircraft still use propellers, it's just that those propellers are now jet-powered. They call the propeller at the front of an engine a fan, and the fan has two jobs. It both feeds air into the core of the engine, and it accelerates air around the core and out the back of the engine. The ratio of the air that goes around the core of the engine to the air that goes through the core of the engine is called the bypass ratio. And you find, if you look at it, that the jets that have the highest bypass ratio, meaning the most air going around, are actually the most efficient. Now that's kind of counterintuitive, wouldn't you want to speed up the air as fast as possible? But the answer, it turns out, is no, that just wastes too much energy. It turns out it's better to accelerate a large volume of air just relatively slowly, just barely faster than you're going, versus to accelerate a small amount of air really, really fast. The challenge, however, is that moving a fan fast enough to actually accelerate air requires a lot of energy, and it's not really something you can get from a battery or an electrical engine. The alternative to electricity, of course, is jet fuel, and the place where that enters is in that core of the engine. The air that is sucked by the fan into the engine core goes through a very violent process. It's first squeezed by compressors, which are a series of fans that accelerate the air into a tube that's gradually tapering. It's like a sideways funnel. You aren't actually losing any energy throughout that process, you're just consolidating it into other forms. You're turning it into heat and you're turning it into pressure. It's the same as blowing air into a balloon. You're not losing the energy that you're imparting on the air when you blow it into the balloon. You're basically just storing it for later. You're storing it as high pressure that when you release the balloon, it all comes rushing out. Now, once that air is sufficiently compressed and heated up, it enters the combustion chamber where the oxygen of that air is combined with a spritz of jet fuel and a spark to produce a controlled explosion, which forces the air to race out the back of the engine. But here's where the catch comes in. Most of the acceleration of a plane is not from that engine core and that fast moving air after it explodes. They actually take that energy and use it to run the fan. There's a backwards facing fan, they call it the turbine, that sits directly behind the engine core. And what that does is turn really fast, turn your fan really fast in the right direction and therefore accelerate the most air around the core and out the back of the plane. This means that for a normal jet engine today, a turbofan engine, most of the energy that's propelling the plane forward is not coming from the explosions directly, but rather by the explosions running a fan. It's crazy. And if that sounds hard to build, I mean, it is. As I said, it's really conceptually simple, but all of those details coming together and working in perfect concert with each other is extremely hard. You need to build a series of fans that spin at 4,000 rotations per minute. You ensure that those fans and the housing around them can tolerate heats up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit and design them so that they only get that hot. You can't let friction light the engine itself on fire. You have to release the perfect amount of fuel into the combustion chamber, not so much that it is used inefficiently, but not so little that it is extinguished. You have to make sure that the air moving out the combustion chamber is moving fast and is very hot, but not so fast that it blows out the flame or so hot that it melts the engine. You have to capture the perfect amount of energy using those turbines. Not so much that your turbines melt, but not so little or the fan won't turn fast enough. Oh, and of course, you have to start your engine without the turbine. This is the cold start problem, and it's one of the hardest things in building a jet engine. Now, not only do you have to do that, but you also have to do it with a small, light, aerodynamic engine. You also have to do it in a way that the government approves of, whether from noise or emission standards or safety standards for that matter. Ultimately, you actually have to prove that your engine will work even when a frozen chicken is fired into it. It should not be surprising to you that only a handful of companies have ever built working jet engines, and that those development programs cost tens of billions of dollars to complete. It is very hard to build a jet engine that can reliably and efficiently produce thrust. And even once you do, your job building a plane is not over. Planes generate lift using their wings. <laughs> That's not enough? Come on! Okay, well, planes do use their wings to generate lift, but it is really not as simple as it might seem. Wings should generate lift exactly as it does when you stick your hand out of the car. You're basically hitting the air, it's deflecting down, it's pushing your wing up, right? Well, it turns out that that is actually less than half the total lift that a wing experiences. 
I know, it doesn't make any sense, but apparently most of the lift from a wing comes not from a pushing force from the bottom, but rather a pulling force from the top. Whenever something moves through a fluid, it generates a region of high pressure and a region of low pressure. In the case of a cannonball moving through air, the high pressure region is in front and the low pressure region is in the back. If we can just flatten that cannonball, it'll keep the same sort of properties and it won't generate lift. This is true of most wing shapes, including the airfoil shape that modern wings almost always use. But if we tilt the wing backwards ever so slightly, we suddenly get a strong lifting force. So you should be able to see what's happening here. As soon as we introduce a tilt, which aero people call an angle of attack, then we have that region of high pressure beneath the wing and low pressure above the wing. The high pressure pushes towards the low pressure, the low pressure pulls it from the top, and that's what creates lift. The reason why this creates lift is more complicated, and it relies on air pressure. Imagine a column of air that is extending directly above you, all the way from you to the top of the atmosphere. It's natural to think about that column as empty, but of course it's not. There's air molecules there, and air molecules do have a weight, however small. At sea level, a single square inch feels about 14.7 pounds of pressure. Imagine trying to lift a 15 pound weight with just the tip of your pinky. It seems almost impossible, but you're doing it every second of every day. The secret is that air is a fluid. Solids like this phone just push straight down, but the air that's around it, the air that's around my hand is pushing in all directions equally. It's like that balloon. The balloon is not filled up in one direction, it's filled up in every direction. So the reason that my pinky doesn't get crushed by atmospheric pressure all the time is that it's being pushed on in all directions equally, from top and bottom and the sides. There's also internal pressure in my body that's pushing back against my skin on this way, which is why my finger doesn't just deflate. Now that sounds kind of crazy, but you actually do, again, have an intuitive understanding of how this works. You might know that once lightning strikes, thunder is what happens when the vacuum that is briefly created collapses. That big smashing sound is literally the two sides of air just crushing into each other after they're separated by the lightning. Now this is what happens too if you have a steel drum that you evacuate of air. There's the normal air pressure around it, just pushing down at 14.7 PSI, but then inside it, there's nothing to push back. So if there was ever a rupture in that tank, it'll just crunch. That's the air rushing from high pressure to low pressure. And that's what's happening in the case of our wing as well. If we have that pocket of high pressure below the wing and low pressure above it, we're going to be pulling and pushing at the same time. So with all of that, that just leaves one question, which is why does that pressure differential exist? And the answer is, nobody really knows. <laughs> I made an entire video about this. I can't believe that it's true, but it's true. It is very hotly debated. There are equations. Of course, we know how planes fly, but it's very difficult to explain. So check out that video if you're interested in learning. All right, and with that, we did it. We have counterbalancing forces. We have gravity that's pulling us down. We have the wings lift that's pushing us up. We have drag that's pulling us back, and we have our engines which are thrusting us forward. It is amazing to me that we figured out all this flight stuff when we did. Back in the 1900s, we had just discovered like elevators. <laughs> At the same time, we were discovering planes. I hope that this video helps you both understand and appreciate how planes fly. And I especially hope that it'll help you enjoy my newest episode of my podcast, which I talked to a person building a supersonic jet with an electric adaptive turbine. Basically, as I mentioned, there's this mechanical connection between the turbine and the fan. He has replaced that. They are decoupled. And instead, they capture energy electrically and then power the fan electrically. I know I said that that couldn't work early in this episode, but he's making it work. That is Ian from Astro Mechanica on the First Principles podcast. So I hope you'll check it out.